Hey guys, welcome to And The Writer Is. I'm your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with the great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special live events, or buy that merch, aka that hat I always wear. Go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's multi-Grammy winning iconic producer is one of the most notable entrepreneurs and executives in the game. Baby, 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 oh, this guy has penned quintessential evergreens for some of the most legendary artists across all genres of all time. He's written the kind of hits that you can't imagine didn't always exist. All the single ladies and the rest of us have been under his umbrella for 30 years of his musical genius. And in addition to crafting records for generational talents like Mary J. Blige, Mariah Carey, and Celine Dion, he is the founder and creator of Red Zone Entertainment. From Atlanta, this man has quite literally changed the music industry from successfully navigating both sides of it whilst still being a family man. And the writer is... Tricky Stewart. Hey, thank, thank you, man. That was a that was a, a great introduction. So, uh, full, full disclosure: about ten years ago, there, there was some artist, and I can't remember the name of who they, who they were. were. That was that was Epic, Epic. and I had a song that I wrote, that I wrote with a producer named D Mile, who's great, and. Uh, and, and you, you were a and it, and, it, and I, was I was doing everything I could at that point to get into the songwriting, songwriting game. game. And, and you, you liked, liked this one song, and you called, called my phone, and I was in Mexico, and, and my mom, mom and my dad, dad answered my phone. My phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And, 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 and I called, called I, I, I came back, and they were like, um... Tricky, Stuart called you. And I was like, What? I gotta find what song was. I don't think it, 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 it ended up coming, coming out. I just remember, I just remember I, we were working, working on some lyric notes and whatever. And whatever. I, called I called you back and we, 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 talked, we talked for a minute and then. And, um, but at, at that time in my career, it was like to have, you know, to have you call me on my phone was like a solid landmark because I was just, you know, at that, at that point, point I've been, been studying, studying your songs, songs for a long time. So, uh, uh, pretty, pretty cool, cool that, you know, know that, that was a, a random first <laughs> meeting with my mom and my dad, dad telling me that you had, uh, you had, you had called, called earlier in the day. day. <laughs> that's, that's a cool story. <laughs> um, you know, I was trying to get you on, man. I was trying to get you on. I appreciate that. that. Okay, okay, so, so let's, let's start, start from the beginning. beginning. Both, Both of us are are, are uh, Chicago suburban nights of sorts. sorts. You uh, you grew you were born in in Illinois. Illinois. Um, yeah, and uh, I was born in Markham, Illinois. Grew up in the Calumet City Dalton uh, area, which is um, a south suburb. It's about thirty five minutes drive to downtown Chicago. So, grew up there. Went to Thornwood High School. Um, Dropped out of Thornwood High School, moved to LA, chasing my dreams, and um, we're still out here. I, I guess you could say the rest is history, but we're still trying to make it. So I don't want it to be history just yet. I, I just wanted to be part of the story. I love, I love that. that. Were, your were your parents, parents musicians? musicians? Obviously, Obviously, your brother is a, a prominent musician, but were your parents musicians? Um, everyone in my family is a musician of some sort. So from the standpoint of, I grew up. Um, as a church musician and, and playing and wanting to play in my mother's choir, who um, it was kind of like the thing that the family did. It was like, whether it's my cousin, Ku Corral, my brother, Laney, my cousin, Sean Sepal, Jason Weaver, like the big thing was like getting involved into that choir. So with the whole big quest as a kid was being good enough to become the drummer of that choir. And well, while on the side at Trinity United Church of Christ down on 95th Street, 
actually being the drummer for um, for their choir on the side. But at the same time, my uncle Butch Stewart, rest in peace, uh, was a really big jingle producer in Chicago, uh, owned a company by the name of Joy Art. And, you know, I grew up doing the commercials with all my cousins, like Big Mac, Filet of Fish, Quarter Pound of French Fries, I see Coke, Big Shakes. So it was all that kind of stuff. And we did all that stuff. Like that was kind of the vibes of what we did on the weekends. It was like, you know, go do commercials for our Uncle Butch and play in the choir. So, you know, the whole family does music. My dad, who I wouldn't, I personally didn't, I mean, maybe, I, maybe I'm maybe i being disrespectful, but um, I didn't really view him as a musician much, um, although he directed choirs and things when him and my mother met, but he had gone more into uh, radio and became a program director. And my mom, who also, you know, sang for uh, Aretha Franklin, uh, giving him something he could feel and all that, she became a program director after that. So, but my dad ended up at the end, uh, like, I guess kind of after he like chilled a little bit, uh, after that part of music ended up going back to school and becoming a classical pianist, which I was like, yeah, whatever. Like anybody could read music. That's not a big deal. But I guess overall, yes, I come from a musical family and, uh, that's kind of what it was like growing up in Illinois for me. And there's just cousins upon cousins upon cousins that do really significant things in music on different levels. Growing up in a family that understands radio programming or being programmed directors, as I imagine that that you, you have a certain level between that and competing to be in your mom's choir, you know, to play for that. that I imagine that the level of excellence is, is constant in your household. Well, you know, it's interesting because... Although my mom was, because she was also a radio personality and then became a program director, it was also, I never really put it together like that, you know? It wasn't, I didn't really think about it like that because one was like church and just like the, the love of the game kind of like playing and then the other was her playing records and, and meeting meeting stars and doing all that kind of stuff. But I never really... I never really gravitated towards the radio side of it other than just hearing my mom on the radio and, and honestly just monitoring when she was coming home because I knew that we knew that the parties had to stop because we would be throwing some fucking cool ass parties and stuff when my brothers were in high school and I was in like seventh grade and she was on overnight. So it was like that was that was what radio meant to us, you know? Were, 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 were you, you in, in recording st recording studios, studios at that time? I mean, obviously, again, again everybody, everybody making music, music out, you know, and especially in Chicago. Were you, were you just constantly raised in a studio, studio as well? well? And, was and was it secular, secular music? music? Where, did, did your parents play because of the church? church? Were they playing mostly secular or mostly Christian music? Or were they playing... We grew up in a very mixed uncensored household because we loved Earth, Wind and & Fire and we loved Bootsy Collins and we loved uh, Kiss and we loved uh, DeBarge and Rick James and just a lot of stuff that was happening so we loved that as much as we loved James Cleveland and Richard Smallwood and it was just, it was really just talent based I think in my household and um, you know, it, so it wasn't any sort of there was never any conversation of secular versus gospel. It was just, um, it was just what was really, really great music. What, what brought you into, into, you know, obviously leaving, leaving high, high school and then coming to LA to, LA to work on music. music. Before, Before you do that, you have to know that you want to work on music. When do, when do you, you actually start creating music? music? Well, it was, it was a little bit different. You know, I, I would think, most people that would know me from Chicago would know me as an athlete first. So when what sport? Um, football, basketball, and baseball, actually. So um, the thing was, music was the fallback plan. You know how people say, oh, have something to fall back on. I was like, 
oh man, I'm not going to be a professional athlete because once I started getting recruited and they were telling me that I was too short and that ultimately they were going to have to change my position and this and that, I was like, oh yeah, I need something to fall back on. So that fall back on was music because I knew I like in my environment, that's what you do. That's like, that's like having, uh, an ice cream shop up the street and you would go, it was just like, I'm going to go work in dad's ice cream shop. It wasn't, it wasn't like a dream. It was like, all right, well, I got to get to LA because I got to make some music. It was more like that. That's crazy. What were, what were your positions in what sports? Like in football, in football, what did you play? I played quarterback in football. I played pitcher and shortstop in baseball. And I played point guard as football, I mean, in, in basketball. So from the standpoint of what I think it takes to be a good producer, it was the lateral move for me into a different thing about, you know, what the responsibility of a music producer was, is to be in control, call the right plays, put the right combinations of things together, see the field a certain way, and then execute. So that's where, like, even with the red zone, that's where that all comes from. It's like, yes, we're playing basketball. Yes, we are playing music, but we play it from a football perspective. And the whole idea is to be in the red zone so that you have an opportunity to score. So philosophically, uh, being in the in the red zone and staying in the red zone is just kind of giving yourself in this business that is really, really hard to stay in. The longevity part really has to do with staying in the red zone and, and a lot of that has to do with just decision making, um, staying focused on the right thing, making sure that you're um, spending time making music and, and ultimately making sure that you're spending time selling music. There's a lot of people in our business that just like to make it, but you have to sell it, too, because that's the, that's the second part of, of creation is, is um, getting it to the right artist and getting it to the right vehicle, because you can easily write a hit song that if it doesn't get heard or to the right person and get access, it could just be a great song that no one knows. Yeah, yeah it sits on your iTunes. <laughs> and, I mean, even, even just the work, work ethic that you get from being a professional athlete, athlete you, you, know, you know, you would, would never, never, you know, you, know, you don't, don't show up to games, games you, know, you know, you don't necessarily show up to the games, games fucked, fucked up. You might, you might actually stretch before you play a game. Like you might actually want to do a little research or like treat it like it's a, you know, you, you, know, you go, go to the gym and you work out when you're a professional athlete. athlete. There's, There's you, you, you can, can do that, that as a musician too and actually, actually put in time to be a better musician. Absolutely. I like a lot of the publishing companies that treat, Treat, treat you know, you know sessions, sessions like, like it's a like, like it's a game, game and not sessions, sessions like it's a practice. And I, think and I think a lot of songwriters think of, oh, well, let's just go and do another session. session. It's like, well, you know, you know maybe the song might just show up, show up and sound, sound a little bit like that, that too. too. Right, right, absolutely. It's all it's all in the approach, and from our standpoint, I've been able to bring that that intensity level, I think, to to music. Now, now, when you moved, moved to LA, LA you, you your, your first cuts are, are a lot of them are you know doing remixes, remixes and stuff. And remixes, remixes I feel like have, have taken, taken on, on different, different you know different, different meanings, meanings as time's time gone on. But, but why, like, like when, when you first got to LA, LA how, how long was it from when you got, got off the plane or out of a car, car or however you got to LA? LA. How, how long, long did it take to get from, from, from the car to, to you know, getting, getting into a recording studio? Um, so gosh, my memory is so bad at some of these things, so I might mess up the story just a little bit. But, um, what ended up happening is we got to Los Angeles. Um, we had a relationship with a gentleman by the name of Lil Silence Jr., the late, great a and um, for MCA Records, who kind of was the brains behind um, New Editions, uh, Any Heartbreak, BBD, uh, Poison Album, uh, a lot of Pebbles, L.A. and Babyface, a lot of their early big hit songs, Bobby Brown's, like that era of music. And I was really, really attracted to that era of music. So we made it our business to build a relationship with Lil Silas 
And when I say we, I mean my brothers and I, Laney and Mark. And Laney had a pre-existing relationship with him to the point that when we were in Chicago, uh, Lou used to fly to L.A. to work with uh, with Laney when I was underneath Laney as a producer. So um, we had some inroads there. Uh, and then we had inroads with a few other A&R people. So with that being said, we got to L.A. We weren't, like, coming from nowhere, right? So it was really just a matter of me creating an access point or an access line to Lil Silas Jr. as far as I was concerned and the artists that had really, um, you know, really just kind of set my soul on fire musically. So if you can imagine, like, you know, if right now we have in Atlanta here, we have an, uh, a creative team and a label going crazy with uh, QC with P and Coach. So, you know, if you're a rapper right now and you like Little Baby and you like the City Girls and you like Lil Yachty and the things that they have going on, this is a calling card for you to want to be part of that culture. And it becomes your job at that point to get to that label. And that's what that kind of represented at that point. It was, it didn't seem that hard because the, the address, you knew where the people were. It was on the back of every album. So it was just a matter of like, whether it was being by his car, knew him where he ate, <laughs> knew him like, it's a little bit stalkerish, but you kind of just get in a position to be discovered and to have a conversation to remind someone that they know you and that you've met them or whatever the situation is. And those remix opportunities came by the way of him just saying, uh, kind of, get out of my face, kid. You know, like, I know you're talented. I heard some of your shit back when I was in Chicago, but, you know, really, you know, my shit didn't sound nothing like, you know, what was going on at the time, which was L.A. and Babyface was making Don't Be Cruel and Teddy Riley was doing Guy and Jamin Lewis were doing, um, you know, um, Any Heartbreak and, 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 and Janet Jackson. So, my music clearly wasn't on that level, but um, it was it was a matter of just getting there to try to be part. And uh, I believe he threw us a couple of remix opportunities, let us work with some of the the other artists um, that were on the label, uh, which were like Aaron Hall because he had just started his own label, so he had Aaron Hall, Shantae Moore, a um, few other things, but and and Damian Hall, so. Uh, we had my brother Laney had been doing Aaron Hall's album. We had gotten like a little uh, some ideas on there that tur- that he grew up for us, turned them into records, and ended up with two records on there. Um, and then from there, that relationship just turned into us getting on that Bobby Brown, if it ain't good enough, remix of the Ellie and Babyface record, right? And that was a big record at the time. And to have that opportunity was just like did immense things for our confidence, which led us to getting our first placement as producers with our name as the, you know, as the main thing on Shantae Moore's uh, album, one of her early albums. I can't, uh, Love Supreme, I think it was called. Um, I think it was called Love Supreme. Don't quote me on that. But yeah, so yeah, was, just was, was, trying to was. build that relationship we would just take any opportunity, and a lot of times those opportunities came in the form of remixes. How is, How is your relationship, relationship with your brother? brother? I mean, I, I imagine you were, you were a younger brother. brother. Yeah. You know, um, going, going and working with your... I, I, don't I don't have a brother, brother I have a sister, but, but if, if we, we work together, together, I'd kill her. You know, you know it's, it's like, like, I don't, I don't know, know how... Two, there's, <laughs> two, there's three of us all together. But one does business. One is the manager, and then there's the two brothers that produce. I see how, how how are you guys in a you know with it are you are you guys equal when you're in a studio together or was it like no you're my little brother were you guys or was it always like no we're brothers it doesn't really matter who's older or younger no i mean like i think how do i explain it i think from the standpoint of i think we know who does who does what best and at the early on in my career, like he did everything better. So there was never a question of like who does what best. But I think overall we have the same, we have a very similar skill set. So, you know, a lot of times we spend time working with other people doing the same thing 
with other groups of people. So it's not, um, we've never had an occasion to bang, uh, to bang heads like creatively because we always were, we were always the engine of whatever room we were in. You know, we were the driving force of the room that we were in. So there hasn't been a whole bunch of like, let's get in the studio and collaborate. You know what I mean? When did, when did you, you know, know you could, could you, know, you know, create music without, your, your, you know, without, without your brothers, brothers in the room? Or is it pretty, pretty close? close? Were you at, at that point already, already doing, doing, you know, you guys are in separate rooms room sometimes? Or, or, you know, you know when you said brother, brother was just better than everything, everything then you well, were... Well, you know, it, it's different, you know, like, you got to understand, this is a time where technology is not the same. There's no shortcuts, so... A really good producer sounded completely different than you sound. So it's not like everybody had the same plugins or everybody had the same advantages. It's like a really good producer sounded like he was had a completely different job than you did, right? And that's what. So there was no, there was no, um, there was no confusion about who that person was in the studio. Uh, uh, the CEO life of yesteryear, right? And and I, I think that went in every situation. So um, it just wasn't a lot of, like, I knew I could produce when my shit sounded like everybody else's and when it sounded as good. And I was literally deep into my career before it was time for me to actually start producing. Like, I was, I, I was part of teams, I could add pieces and it might have been my record and it might have been my idea, but being responsible for what the final product sounded like, I was, it wasn't probably until. I mean, it was, I mean, it was another, another 12, 12 years, years after, after those songs. songs. Like, like when, when, when you get, get like that, the, not, I mean, even before that, that but like once, once, you know, what I was going to say is even after, after you, you, start you start getting those that, that confidence, confidence. You're starting, starting to get, get cuts, and, and you start getting, getting some big names on your, on your discography: the Color Me Bads and the Braxtons and 98 Degrees and all, all the things. things. Tony, 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 Tony. Come on, like, like just, just legends. legends. Yeah. And, and you know, you know, you, you're, you're working, working on all kinds of like amazing records. Um, but but the kind of success you have later is so so different. Because I think I think the big thing is right is the those those records and yes you're making money and you're you are the thing you you're part of the thing, but until you start driving the albums, until your record is the record, you're not producing. Like in my opinion, like you're just making music and a lot of people can make music, but when you become a hit maker, then you become responsible for how the ecosystem is built. And that's a completely different feeling in music. And there's a lot of people who get addicted to going to the studio, making music, having a bounce and thinking, no, you're not like that person. You're not, you're not like that person. What they're doing is changing the way that the game sounds. And, and, and the era that you're alluding to is when I found the dream and we started writing the umbrellas and the falsettos and the, you know, the babies and all those different things. And there was nobody on the planet that had a record that sounded like the records that we were making and the concepts were better. The, the everything, the sonics were better. The effects were different. And it was just, it's that thing that I'm talking about that I can recognize in Jam and Lewis having that thing or, or LA and Babyface where it's like, you'll know if you're there or not. Like, you know what I mean? And when you hear it, you'll know that why certain people's names become household names from making records, whether you're talking about the Mike Will Made It or the DJ Mustards or the, you know, like, and I'm specific, specifically talking about more on the urban culture right now. But it's like, you'll know why people know those names because when you line those records up and you line that body of work up, what you definitely know is that they know what the hell they're doing, you know, every single time. Whether you like the record or not, that'll become one thing. But what it will what it will have is the opportunity to drive a record company one way or the other. There's, There's a, a huge, huge difference between, between you, know, you know, when you're saying, saying uh, you know, the, the you're, you're naming, naming producers, producers and you're saying more on, more on the, the urban, urban culture. culture but, but all, all of those, those producers, producers you named defined, defined like, like a pop era. era. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem like, like it's, it's not, not like, like your discography, discography is, is, you know, it, it, it really, really all, it, it, you, you managed, managed you, you were working with, with artists, artists like Pink. Pink. Do you, know Do you know what I mean? You're working, working with, with color, color me back. Ba- like they, they, they were still like uh, they, they were pretty. pretty it felt, felt like you were still in the pop world. world. You know? Yeah, I mean, I my like I said to my my upbringing allows me to be authentic in every generation. So when you listen to Katy Perry's. Hummingbird heartbeat, and you go, wait, that's the same dude that did JT Money. Like, I can get authentic, like, with, I can get authentic, and whatever the thing is, it's not going to, you know, one of the things that I love about my my creativity is that it's not going to be on display through a sound. So it's like I truly take on the the era, the 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 mindset of of turning into that um turn it into that artist and letting and and giving them the thing that they really need and not necessarily having a sound that dictates what's gonna come from our collaboration how did, how did you, you meet the dream, dream who, who obviously, obviously becomes like, like a, a big, big collaborator, collaborator throughout, throughout you know that, you know, that next, next level, level like, like you were saying, saying that's, that's the, the jimmy, jimmy jam, jam terry, terry lewis, lewis yeah. you know that's, that's the, the baby, baby face and Ali Reed. Reed. That's, that's like the, the you know that's, that's the, the moment, moment when you guys have this this team, team that's, that's like unstoppable. Um, side, side note, note like, like that that dream, dream album is like is like in my like island, island albums as far as, as, far as <laughs> you know not, not, those, those melodies are just so effortless and the the tracks are just it's it's just such a classy sounding album, but you know. Umbrella, umbrella kind of like is the, the along with, with I mean there's this, this whole list of songs that you guys did in a very short amount of time how did you guys meet and why, and why did you know, know that this was going to be a thing after you know, after, you know what, was what was the thing, thing? what is what that, is that, that everyone everyone's always searching for I think um, I met Dream because Dream was signed uh, with my brother Laney um, Laney uh, signed Dream and then Dream ended up not being signed because his contract kind of expired or whatever you call it is uh, when the contracts are over or whatever and ultimately what ended up happening is Dream went out and kind of became something different and on his own and really started kind of making dabbling with making tracks as well as writing songs as well as shooting videos as well as just kind of dove completely into his creativity. And I really honestly didn't really know what Dream had to offer before that point, before he took his own career into his own hands. Uh, I just knew he had a lot of melodies and a lot of, um, a lot of melodies and a lot of ambition. And what ended up happening is through that time period, he can't ended up coming back. And I really had like a, a, a real love for the music that he was making um, with Nivea at the time. And um, we ended up getting in the studio because we hadn't spent any time in the studio. And it was a this kind of critical time where I was kind of figuring out what I was going to do with my the next wave of my career. And I knew I wanted to make some changes sonically and engineer-wise. So I called my cousin Cook, who... Um, at the time had left music alone and was doing something completely different and I called him and I said hey man I really could use some help down here like I'm I'm kind of like I feel like something good is about to happen but I need somebody to lock in with me and he's like cool like and uh, we had that conversation and he moved to Atlanta and um, he cut the, or I don't know if he moved or if he came and he started spending time but somehow he ended up in Atlanta during that same time, Dream and I had been put in a position where we were kind of the only two writers that were around, um, like right after the first of the year, because there was a lot of people traveling and people take time off during that time. So we were just kind of up there, um, and I was at the studio, and he said, "Can I come by?" I was like, "Yeah," and we got a little bit of chance to like kind of be alone for about four or five days, and. Um, we started writing. We started um, just kind of getting 
but we thought getting our wheels ready for the next year while everybody was on vacation and stuff like that. And by, you know, by the time three or four days went by, like we wrote Umbrella first. <laughs> and then we wrote Suffocate right after or shortly there, either before or after. And those are both those records were both number one. One was obviously a smash. The other one was still a number two pop record. Um, and you know, I had other writers that I was working with and and things like that. So about that time, I, you know, everybody started coming back from vacation or the 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 Christmas break, and I'm just like, hey, hey guys, like um, I need you to kind of like hold up, like kind of got something going here, like with us just being kind of locked in. And we just started writing. Like, we just started writing songs like crazy. And ultimately, our differences is of influence, I think, complement each other really well. Um, uh, I think, because like I said, I, I, I definitely am that Jam and Lewis, Babyface, Teddy Riley, Devontae Swing type energy. And Dream is the Otis Redding type like he's a old soul melodies like he grew up with his grandfather so his sense of melodies are from a different generation and um so what what he got through his subconscious listens as a kid and what i got through mine kind of creates this thing that creates these really um that has the ability to create really melodic melodies and darkness at the same time. And I think that's what the, what that combination really led to. And it's, um, it was super, super dominant. I mean, we pretty much, I think we really changed the way people produce. I think the super sessions that we see today are kind of like a, a result of that, you know, because we had Ku Carell cutting vocals. We had us just sitting in the chamber writing day in, day out. Uh, we had Jason Joshua and Dave Pensado working together in a collaborative state on mixes. We had Tech, uh, Tech O I, uh, what's Tech? Yeah, Tech on um, vocal effects only. Like it was a real assembly line type of efficiency. And we started taking up so much real estate and music um, by taking hope over whole albums that I think people really had to really adjust to how they make records. And, uh, and now I think you see the super sessions with four and five producers, but you know, we had the jazz, we had Jazzy Faye collaborating with us. We had Los the Maestro collaborating with us on the musical side. So we were getting energy all over the place. So, you know, to be able to take over Mary J. Blige's album, Growing Pains and Win Album of the Year, um, Contemporary Album of the Year, do Mariah Carey's whole album, you know, have six songs from my company um, between myself and Esther Dean on the um, Teenage Dream album and doing whole films with Burlesque. And, you know, like people were just surprised by the bandwidth and the speed. And, you know, we we kind of had a... Like, like, did you, you have, have any other life, life outside, outside of this, or is this just like straight, straight up? I mean, I mean, this sounds like you were only in the studio, studio right? right? Like, like you, you must have, have slept, slept in the studio. studio. I mean, yeah, we lived, we lived a, um, we lived a very uh, interesting life during that time, just because, you know, we the way that we like to work, we took everybody to Las Vegas. We stayed in Las Vegas, so we were on the clock all the time. So we worked under pressure and we liked people to come out there because in order for us to be out there, we're in 13 rooms, 13, 14 rooms. So, you know, it's like labels are like, are you kidding me? We're not, we're not paying that. We're like, well, you can come out and, you know, and at that time we were so hot that, I mean, it's like, if you came out there like there was no chance that you weren't going to get your single. It didn't matter. It didn't even matter. It just didn't have a chance. And it's like, no one really cared because we would operate so quickly. Um, 
you know, we were doing whole albums like the Love Hate album was written in two nights. Like we did did it and we went to Las Vegas and we finished it. And that was the first time that we really touched ba- touched down Las Vegas because we knew we had the album done. And we were like, let's go to Las Vegas and finish it, you know, because the truth of the matter is we were having like a lot of success and we could feel we could feel that we had something different. But Atlanta was so hot. There was so many hot producers. Polo the Don was super hot. Yeah. Uh, Brian B. Cox and Jermaine were super hot coming off of We Belong Together. You know, like uh, Sean Gare was super hot. So our whole thing was let's go someplace so that. If somebody wants to mess with Trick and Dream, they got to come see us. And it's not just a part of a group that trip. So we made people really make decisions about whether they wanted to be in business with us or not. And by the time you came to Las Vegas, we made it where you didn't want to leave. And a lot of times we would end up with that whole album before the artist even, before they could even blink. The, the time, time it takes, takes to, from, from writing a record, record to a record coming out, out is a long, long time. time. And, and, you know, you guys, you guys, you guys had, had that first week, week where you guys wrote, wrote Umbrella and, and Suffocate. When, when one, one is, is at, at that point, point to, get to get a Rihanna, Rihanna cut with, with Jay-Z, Jay-Z is, is still like, like the thing, thing that kind of launches. Like you, like you were saying, saying it's, not it's not like the other songs weren't. Killing, killing it, it. But, there's but there's like a different, like a different level, level of that, of that kind, kind of success. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, success, that's success too, you have to remember. Rihanna wasn't Rihanna at that moment. So it was like she was very much like a uh, an artist that people looked at as a pop artist, didn't really yeah. had, hadn't had a cultural connection. So it felt more like Sean Kingston or... Uh, Jason Derulo, been like that, and this record solidified her as a overall thing to the to all cultures on all the on all the planets. So it was just a it was a very very special record that can do that. Um, but that's what it takes a lot of times to get to that global stardom. Usually, Usually I, like I like to talk, talk about you know, you know the stuff, stuff that happens between the successes, the successes but, but it's really hard to do that in this era because of how much material you're putting out that are hits. Um, again, again, like, like single, single ladies is another one of those moments that I, that I think is like, like a little, little bit bigger than the other moments, moments you know, you know the, the other big moments. Big moments. Mm-hmm. That, that track, track is fucking crazy. crazy. <laughs> like, like, I mean, I mean how, how do you write that? that like, how does, how does that, that song, how does that song work? Why does that song work? I feel like every part of that song should not, should not work as well as it does. <laughs> like it makes, it, makes it, it, it doesn't you know it's like, like it, it just seems like it comes, comes from another planet. planet. Um, when you're, when you're done, done writing a song, a song like that, that do you, do you know, know it's to hit? Do you, do you call, call Beyonce, Beyonce directly and say, "Hey, you, you should cut, cut this song"? Do you, do you pu- like? like well, well, no, that that song was different because we were on tour with Jay Z and Mary J. Blige for the Heart of City tour, and when we got to North Carolina or something like that, they were like, "We we had four days and." Madison Square Garden, and they were like, um, they had sent a message. I can't remember who sent the message over, but they were like, hey, B would like to get in the studio with you guys when we get to New York, so you're going to be here for 4A. So we come in the studio, and it's, we're at um, Rock the Mic, and it's just, um, you know, it's us. Stargate is in one room, we're in the other room, and we're just kind of going back and forth. Like, you know, she's making records in there, we're making records over there. Single Ladies is the first record we did you know when we when we came in um because we were just i mean we were fired up man like because we were also you gotta understand we're also on the studio bus like so we got all this creative energy and then we had gotten timberland's studio bus so we're making the electric red album while we're on the bus you know so now it's like oh, be in new york come on of course we ready so um, I called my my cousin, Sean, Sean K, and I was like, yo, going to studio with Beyonce. I was like, I need some new drum sounds, bro. Like, send me some new drum sounds. So he sent me, he's like, I got you. And this is MPC 3000 stuff, so it's not like just trading sounds. It's like, you got to send it, make the disc, send the disc, like, got to meet, like, Federal Express to New York, all that. So we get the disc. 
put in the sounds, make the beat. I'm about to throw the beat away because I'm not used to the sounds. So I'm like, I'm about to like go to the next one. And Dream was like, what are you doing, dog? Like, I was like, I'm about to start another one. He's like, the hell you are? I got a whole song written in that shit in my head. He's like, man, turn the mic on, man. He's like, drop the track in and, and turn the thing and, and turn the mic on. And he was like mad at me. Like, he was like kind of frustrated. Like, what are you talking about? You about to do another beat. And I'm like, all right, well, put it up. And then, shit, man. And he's like, I'll just take the That was the first thing that came out of his mouth. And he wrote the record and we, we customized the record, which is why it has so many unorthodox things in it. Like, it's like the bridge is like six and a half bars or some crazy stuff. But we, you know, we just, we do things out of feel. You know, we, like, Dream and I, we weren't scared to try stuff. Like, we would change the the pitch of the keyboards all just for the bridge to make them go up. Like, were you, like, is that, did the key change? No, it didn't change. It's just sharp as hell right now, you know? But, um, yeah, I mean, that, that situation was just, a magical situation. Um, we did the record. Tata immediately came in. He heard the record. And because at the time, I think when we were working, I don't think Beyonce really had a plan for making a record. Like, so I don't think she was making a record. I think she just wanted to get in, right? And Tata comes in and he goes, he looked at B and he goes, you're going to have a really hard time not putting that out. And he's like, I know you. And it's going to be hard for you not to put that album out like so. And sure enough, so we went over and we played the record. We played it. Um, Stargate was in the other room because at this time, it's like a lot of Rock Nation synergy. So it was very common for us to be in the studio with Stargate at the same time, you know, because if we were working with Rihanna or whatever, a lot of times they would be in the other room as well. So it was so we walk over, we play the record. Um, Matthew Knowles is there. And um, like sitting in the back and we come in, we play the record. And everybody's like, I love that. Like, that's really cool. But like, kind of like, you know, like it's a little left to center. So everybody kind of knows it, but they're like, that shit's dope, you know? And then Matthew knows goes, he's like, what's the name of it? And we like, put a ring on it. He's like, why the hell is it called put a ring on it if you keep saying all the single ladies? And so that's how it came, became single ladies, put a ring on it. You know, just because he was like, no, it should be called single ladies. And um, it's a good so example yeah. when, you're when you're a producer, producer and you put out and you, and you finish a track, a track that you think sucks, sucks or, or if, if you're a songwriter, songwriter and you have a concept that's really, really weird, weird and like it's it's, it's hard, hard to bring up, up in a session, session those, those are the ones that are going to be different because they're, they're going to be the one that, that, that because you're doing, you're doing full, full albums, constantly, constantly putting, putting out music. music to create, to create something, something that's different, different than, than the other songs, songs that you're putting out, even, even when, when you, you do, do you do a whole Mariah album or a whole Mary J. Blige album, album or whatever it is, you still have to have one or two of those songs stand out from the rest of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, so, like, those are going to be the ones that are probably, you know, some of those are going to be the ones that are just different. Maybe not better than, just they're going to be different. Yeah. I mean, I think that was the case with Just Fine. I mean, Just Fine on Mary J. Blige's album was a completely different perspective. Mary historically had been a little bit upset. <laughs> you know, she's always kind of like had a vibe. And I thought the concept of that record is saying, you know, she had come through all these different things. And and here's, you know, you just, you know, Be Without You is the biggest record and 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 now here it is i'm I'm just fine like i'm i'm okay i made it through these trials and tribulations and it's all right let's have a let's have a party and and one of the things that i love so much about that record in particular is that you know just going to a mary j Blige show and someone that established and that has so many hits and to know that you created a moment in her show that's always going to be either the last song Mm-hmm. Or the second to the last song before that show is over, is it was a huge accomplishment for me, you know. Um, the the do, do, well, before, well, before I get to the next phase of of, of hits, because I think there's like this, there's, there's an, another step, step that's interesting. interesting. Are you able to enjoy any of this at the, at the time? time? Like, like you, you're, you're in the middle of being in a studio and you're constantly doing the next song. song. 
Did you, Did you ever, ever stop, stop and realize, realize that you're working with the best of a generation, generation or were you like, like well, man, we, we got to go in the studio. We got to write a hit. We can beat this. We can beat this. We can beat this. And you're like, oh, hey, B, hey, Jay-Z, hey, like, uh, whatever it is, Mary, Christina Aguilera, Sierra, whatever it is. These people are just living in your life. I mean, I think for me, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, like, um, because... That's, that's the type, the type of, time of time that I spend in the that's that's the type of lifestyle that I live. Whether the camera's on or not, and whether it's Beyonce or the next Beyonce, it's like I'm living the life that leads to the next thing and I've always led that life um of of dedicating myself to that craft of music and it's what I love to be it's what I love to be doing and to have a career where your every day starts with silence and can end in magic. The possibilities of that are the people that I've met and the, the relationships that I've built, the mentoring that I've been able to do, the lives that I've been able to change, the trajectory of thought process. There's so much that comes from being in the studio other than just the song. So sometimes even when the songs are manifesting themselves to chart toppers, what I am building is a lot of uh, a lot of relationships, a lot of perspective and um Things that ultimately, ultimately, I think, make me a better person and make the people around me better people by us being able to have conversations through songwriting of different cultures and things that people may, these people may understand this and these people may understand this. But when you're trying to get to that common goal and you're using language as the as the uh, as the tool, I think a lot of times there's there's just a lot of camaraderie that goes on. And being in the studio, and by me not having, um, by me not having like success right off the bat, um, I never lost track of the fact of who I was in the room with. Like, I knew exactly the magnitude of being in the room with Mariah Carey, and I wanted those moments, and Mary J. Blige and Christina Aguilera, um, all of them, and 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 those were the special times. Like, in and my most memorable sessions don't sometimes don't have a hit attached to them, but, you know, my ability to build a relationship with Celine Dion so that when she works on albums now, whether I'm hot or cold, she always picks up that phone and says, hey, I know what you do. You know, Lionel Richie, you know, those types of those types of situations. So the, there, there's so much great stuff that comes from it. My, um, legend has become uh, a really uh, over the years and we've not even, I don't even think that we've had a song that stuck yet uh, to make one of his projects, but just so it's all of that, it's like even you know, it's just all of that camaraderie that gets built when you can sit down with people who genuinely, genuinely care about their craft and, and care about music the same really deeply the way that I do and the people that are around me is just I had to take in every last one of those fucking moments. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean your, your collaborators obviously feel, feel the same way because your discography is filled with people who keep coming back for songs. It's, it's not, not the same thing, thing as, you know, one-off one -off songs or one-off one albums, you know. You know the amount, amount of songs, songs you've had released with, with the same artist are each one of their own catalogs, which is pretty, pretty impressive. impressive. But one, one artist that I feel like we have to talk about before we get into some of the business side of your stuff is Justin Bieber, Bieber because, because it's sort of an outlier. One, one thing that's incredible is you're really good at helping women tell their stories. There are a lot of songs with a lot of women. You yeah. know, it's really, really uh, an interesting thing. So the one I was going to ask, ask, why is that? And then, and then also, also the experience of being Justin Bieber's, Bieber's first single that, that really breaks, like kind of breaks him. So, so both, both those things, things I guess, I want to What was the second question? So, like, well, one is, one is like the fact that you have so many, so many women as collaborators and so many of these artists, something you do helps them tell their story and that's different. You know, I know producers where it's mostly men, but it's not this way. Why are you so good at writing for divas? And, you know, so I wanted to know about that. And those are totally separate. Gotcha. Well, I think um, it's interesting that you noticed that. Um, 
because it's kind of like a joke now when I work with new collaborators and they're like, who do you think this is for? I was thinking, you know, throw out a name and it'll be a guy. I was like, well, you know, if that's what you want to do it for, I said, but honestly, generally, I don't even think about men when I think about records. Even when they sound like a man record, I'm like, well, Rihanna can sing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, um, no, I think, I, I think I'm really attracted to, I'm really attracted to the diversity the, the things that women can do away from uh, the song as it pertains to makeup, styling, like all the art that goes with it. Um, I, my mind has always, and what my sound sounds like, I feel like has always complimented women better. When I got in the industry, that was who I really wanted to produce. It was all, always about trying to get on the Whitney's, the the Janet's, the the Mariah's, the Marys, you know, Christina and Brittany. But so that became the list. That became the hit list. And I was like, I gotta work with every last one of them. And I was able to accomplish that, thankfully. And then um so then the criteria just became after a while, I was like, well if I'm gonna work with a man, he's gotta be crazy. So that just put it to the ushers and the um the put it to that put it to Justin Bieber that putting that put it to Frank Ocean in that space you know so I've, I've worked with male artists um I it's interesting you know I think here's what I was saying when I'm a work for hire I like to work with female artists but I love to uh, for the deep dive then I can get it if I got enough. If I can get enough equity on a project like Dream or Frank Ocean, where it has layers, and it's not just about coming in doing whatever needs to be sold, then I like doing the deep dive with male artists, where it's like it's more encompassing, and we can get some different thoughts out there and what a different perspective than what's happening out there. You know what I mean? So I think that's kind of what it is. Then. As far as Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber was just um, Scooter Braun from Atlanta, not from Atlanta, but was living in Atlanta, came up through Atlanta, and ultimately that was my guy. We had took a couple of swings on a couple, couple projects, had tried to, um, you know, whenever he had a project, you know, I have a studio and he would come through with Astro Roth or whatever, and I would, you know, help him put that together or get good mixes for him and all that kind of stuff. And then we had this other artist, uh, these two sisters, twins that we were working with, trying to get signed, Brit and Alex. Um, we weren't able to really get that off the ground, but we just had a lot of respect for each other. And, um, you know, when I was up at Def Jam, uh, because we had quite a bit of things going on up there, uh, success-wise, I happened to be in on a meeting one day, and um, I was up at, at the meeting, and, you know, the, the response to they were going through the roster and the response to Justin Bieber wasn't a favorable one at the time. Nobody really knew who he was. And um, I was like, well, that's my guy Scooter's like project. Like, so let me, um, you know, like if, if he needs music, you know, the music, if you're not sure about the music, like I'm on fire, I'm at Def Jam. That's my friend. Let me do the music. You know, like me and Karen Clark and Chris Hicks went off and kind of did the music. And, you know, I didn't even realize, you know, to give you an example, like of where it was, I didn't even realize it because, you know, we were just so on the grind trying to make shit happen that, you know, I was in Nashville, the seat of the Country Music Awards um, last year. And Scooter was there. And he was like, yeah, like, I'm going to introduce you. He introduced me to Max Hole. And he's like, I want you to know, like, I might not be here if it wasn't for this guy. He financed the first Justin Bieber album because they wouldn't, they wouldn't pay for it, the the EP at first. And I was like, damn, that's right. Like, we didn't even like we didn't even get paid for those songs like on the first EP. Like, it was really like a renegade project when we did one time. You know, it was really like us against the world. And I was just trying to get the kid a record. And then I noticed that he was famous because, like I told you, my family, we've been around this our whole lives. So I got a lot of young nieces and nephews. This kid's never been out before. 
never had a release. And my nieces and nephews don't come to the studio. And um, I come outside. I'm working with the kid. And my whole family's outside. And I'm like, what are y'all doing down here? They're like, it's Justin Bieber in there. And I'm like, what? And they're like, is Justin Bieber in there? And I'm like, I mean, I, I think so. I think that's his name. Like, I'm not sure. Little kid, like, little white kid, cute haircut. Like, yeah. So all my nieces, were the, like, whatever he was doing on YouTube had created quite a gravitational pull. And he had a gravitational pull to him and always has and always will. That is, uh, his stardom is different um, than anybody's that I've ever been around with the exception of probably Michael Jackson. It's a different level of stardom. And he, he just had this thing about him. And next thing I knew, like, I, I can't remember what it was, but I was in the Def Jam meeting. And I remember that they had a, like a, um, uh, like a, a signing for him, like, you know, an in-store and they got there and the, pro- the the person from the label actually got arrested for inciting a riot because of how many kids showed up. And that was kind of like, then that was kind of like the light bulb going off like, oh, snap, like, this kid is like out of here, right? And so um, at that point, somehow, that's when the, that's when the wheels got really got turning and you know, Dream and I were able to do the baby record after that. I think it ended up selling 14 million copies and became, you know, the highest selling single in music history at the time. I think it might have been surpassed now with the, the new calculations of how with the streaming and all that. But as far as back then, that was 14 million real um, downloads of uh, one single song, which had uh, surpassed Candle in the Wind. So that was the pretty... Awesome moment, too. Um, I know know we we can can talk talk about music music on the songwriting side all day, but but you're, you're, you know, know, as an executive and as an A&R person, person, obviously, like, like, we're we're both friends with Ricky Reed. Reed. You You know, know, we've worked at at Epic Epic for a while. while. You went through that. You know, I'd say as an artist, there's no one that's probably more influential that you signed on the executive side and you can probably correct me on this, but Frank Ocean is just so big and um, it's a different kind of music and a different kind of artist than this generation. Like we just don't have a lot of artists that are putting out music. That's not all aiming for a single, 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 single. Instead he's putting out music in a, in a way, way there's, there's a lot of similarity between him and the Dreams albums, albums back, back in the day, day you know? know? It is it's a lot, lot of melody, a lot of interesting lyrics, a lot of cool vibes. How did, How did you get involved with Frank Ocean? Ocean? Well, um, I got involved with Frank Ocean because um, Tab, you know, Tab, um, A&R, super creative, um, he has been a collaborator of mine. He was a, my songwriting partner for many, many years. And he's gone on to sign some really great talents, include Frank included, and um, Alessia Cara, as well as others. But um, he essentially, I believe at the time, was working at a publishing company, and he had signed him to the publishing company. And he, my brother, Mark Stewart, who happens to be my manager and business partner, happens to be Tab's best friend. We've all known each other for about 25 years. Tab brings them to Mark. Mark, um, I'm pretty sure, goes crazy over them. And they set up a meeting for me. And at this particular time, I'm completely, completely slammed. Like, I'm doing Mariah Carey's album. I'm doing Christina Aguilera's movie and her album. And working on and working on a lot of other projects like that are one offs. But the two things that like doing a whole album on Mariah and a whole movie, the soundtrack, music supervision and all that stuff. So they come in and they're like We want him to write with you. Can you get in and 
right with this guy? And I was like, you know, of course the answer is going to be yes, because anytime they ask me to write for something, I can pretty much know that the person is going to be pretty great because that's what they usually bring. But I heard his, I heard his music and I said, and I, I started listening to it and I was like, man, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, I love this guy, but, um, you know, I'm thinking like, whoever sings these records, like, this shit is going to be a real major letdown. Like, Whoever cuts these records, I don't care what artist it was, I heard something in his tone. And I was like, every single one of these things is going to be a disaster. So me trying to, and I'm already living in a in a way, a world that is amazing and that I hate at the same time, trying to get people to capture the world of, of dreams, essences, and nuances. So here it is, I got this other guy that's bringing this whole other thing, but it's just as specific and just as outrageously good as this other thing that I'm working with that I think is absolutely amazing. So we kind of meet in the doorway and I'm going like this and he's coming like that. And I'm like, dude, I'm really, really, I really, really love your shit. I was like, I'm like slammed to the gills. I said, I want to work with you, but the only thing is if I work with you, I don't want to work with you on no writing type shit. I was like, if you'll be my artist, then I'm down. Like, will you be my artist? And that's the way that we can work. I was like, I don't know if you want to be an artist or not, but I said, but the tone, I was like, I don't, I don't want to be trying to cut those songs over on nobody because I'm hearing these songs that, you know, I'm like, Jesus, who is this guy? You know, like, just like, like special, special, special stuff. So that's the story of me signing Frank Ocean. It was uh, put to me up on a silver platter by my long-term collaborators, we met in the hall, in the doorway of the studio at um, the Boom Boom Room that I had rented out for a while. And that's kind of the story. And after that, we just really got into making the records. And, you know, the other, the other big thing was with Frank, you know, when you talk about his, his, uh, his ability to cut through without having traditional hit songs, he has so much mystique. And he always makes sure that he writes a hit. It may not always be the song, but it's always a driver into the project. Like, it's just something as simple as calling his album Blonde and Dying His Hair Green. That's a hit. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a slam dunk. You know what I mean? Like, and the, the art and how that looks. And, you know, he's just a very, very smart guy, and he understands how to... He understands how to be Frank Ocean. That's that's the one thing for sure. And he also understood that he had to be Frank Ocean. You know, like he, the hardest part for me was all those songs that I loved that I was so passionate about. One of the things that came out from that conversation, he says, hey, well, guess what? It, it wasn't that conversation. He goes, you know, I'm willing to be your artist and everything. He's like, but I got to tell you, I hate every song I've ever written. So I have, if, if you want to sign the person who would sing those songs, that's not the artist that I am. So then we had to start over. <laughs> so that was hard because I had I had the type of he was writing records. Frank can write right, you know what I mean? Like even on the early Justin Bieber first EP, like he wrote some of those songs, um, you know, on that on that EP, and he can write. And so when he was brought to me, like he had, you know, he he was writing songs with the intention of, you know, doing it from a writing standpoint, which obviously means you take different types of chances. But, you know, I heard songs that moved me every bit as much as what I hear in Bruno Mars's music. And, you know, you and you wouldn't hear that in Frank's music as Frank Ocean, but as the writer that he once was, like, he has a lot of different gears. Um, there's there's a, a seemingly this moment, moment where you start, start to become an executive, an executive more than a producer and a writer. Obviously, Obviously like, like we were talking about before we even started this interview, you're back in the studio, studio you're back, back to writing and doing a lot more of that. that. And, and it's, it's not that you stopped, stopped writing, writing but, but clearly your, your focus was also being an executive. executive. Is, Is there a reason, reason why you decided to start to push away from the studio? And do you like one more than the other? 
Um, I think, you know, I think it's a couple of things. I think when you, when you play at a really, really high level, it's hard to not play at that level. Like, um, I worked with, I pretty much checked every box of everything that I wanted to accomplish in the music industry. Right. Um, so then you kind of have to decide what you want to do. And what I decided that I wanted to do and why I moved back to Atlanta is because all of, everything that I had done had, had come from this to that. This is the biggest stars in the world now. Like, no one can walk down the street. And I figured out that the only way I was going to be able to get back in the studio and love the studio was to do that with new people and bring that same skill set that I've always brought to those people that have propelled that type of success to new people. Because, you know, it's harder when things get really big like that and it's like you're in Paris during Fashion Week chasing somebody around for a verse, like, you know, and, and you got to sit there for like five days while they're like, you're like, you know, I got, I got shit to do. <laughs> right, you know, like I don't have the time to do this, like you know. So I, I think ultimately that was part of it. I think it's always been my. I am a, um, I'm a huge fan of L.A. Reid. Being influenced by L.A. Reid um, definitely put me on that trajectory of always life after music. Like I, that's I just saw that. Um, as him being my mentor and being someone close to me, that's something that I saw up close and personal from him. And it was something that I, that I really wanted to do. Um, I just had to decide how I wanted to do it and um, how I, how I could do that on my own terms, because um, being an executive is really, really good. And it can, it can be really, really great, but uh, I'm, I really like to win. And I like to win all the time. And I'm not cool with anybody that I sign. I want to see them win. And I can't necessarily be excited over here with something doing very well over here and this doing not doing well. And, and knowing that the same efforts aren't given into all things. And, you know, from that standpoint, it was, uh, it was emotionally tough for me, which is why I just kind of like, I had to figure out exactly how I wanted to go about doing that. Yeah, I mean, that obviously makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of us feel the need to go also to need to be part of the executive side of things, you know, to see if that's the right path, you know, but a lot of us are also songwriters and I can't imagine not being in the studio at the same time, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's what, what the vision is for what I'm doing now. It's like, like you know, you, you have all this skill set and it's like, man, I want to, I just decided, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to get my Dr. Dre on kind of vibe. Like, you know, I want my music to, I want to create my music here. I want to put my music out here. It's like, let's see, let's see what all this skill set being at, you know, one or two addresses can really do. And I'm, Help. I'm, I'm A&Ring, I'm a, uh, consulting, consulting for people, people. I, and, and I'm producing records for the things, things that are on our label. And, and that's, that's kind of the vibe. It's like, it's, uh, I, I was a huge fan of what happened on the Face Records from a creative standpoint and the artists that it produced and uh, all those types of movements that have come out of the line, whether that was so, so deaf that led to the, the, the Brett's career and Bow Wow and Tremaine and Jagged Edge and it just, it just takes someone, someone with a vision to uh, get someplace, be there, and, and be comfortable with the successes that you can have where you are. Because, you know, while L.A. is the big game and it is the entertainment capital of the world, you can make a fortune um, doing music at a high level from Detroit as well, as Gary Gordy proved, you know. And at the end of the day, like I've seen in this business – Anytime that anyone has ever really sat that was talented and focused in and put their craft in a specific area, I've always seen um, very favorable returns when you 
get comfortable with the type of success that you want to have. And when I really looked at how Jermaine Dupree built his situation, I was like, wow, Jermaine Dupree pretty much made records for So So Deaf. And, and then, then if you, you liked, liked what So So Deaf did, he would pick up clients based upon Mariah Carey becoming one of his main, main clients. Or, uh, like, I, I wanted those records. She wanted those records when you listen to the records that they made together early on. Like, those are escape records. Like, she clearly liked escape, right? And she liked that. That's all, like, you know, the Be My Babies and all that stuff. You're like, I see, I see where, where that, that comes, comes from, from. And, and, and sometimes, sometimes you have to have your feet on the ground in, in order to have the thing that the big, big stars want. And that's even with my own success. success. When, when I was locked in down here with Dream and Master Dean and Frank Ocean and those people, that's when the that's when I was able to swing the pendulum uh, our way through mu- musically, our way to. Uh, get where, where the, the things that, that we, we were thinking about in the way that we were hearing records was able to cut through and, and we were able to have that time um that that run in music three or three or four years how long it was when we were really leading and that's a much more fun place to be in the music business from is leading versus trying to catch up no, no doubt in our, in our last segment, segment we're, we're gonna, gonna do a five, five for five, five. i'm gonna list five, five. People, people or things, things and, and just, just tell me what, what comes off the top of your head. Uh, my, my favorite on this list is somebody who I think gets the least amount of credit, not from you, but from the industry, is his impact on what you've done. done but Ku Corral. What? Uh, genius. He's a genius. He really is. Like um, one word or like... Yeah, you, that, you, you can say whatever you want. I mean, there are no rules. I, whatever. No, I mean, I think, I think Kook is a genius and I think he... Um, really helps artists find their their voice, and I think that's really really important. Um, that he helps artists find their true voice, and one of the greatest of all time as a vocal producer. Yeah, it's like when you you mentioned Stargate, and it's like the way Mikel can do vocal production, or the way that like when you find like some of these big writing teams, like there's always the person who who just understands how to produce vocals. And, mm-hmm. and you don't think about it because you're like, oh, well, let's just throw some auto-tune and compression and that's fine. But it's just not really. Like, there's something no, no. intangible about what... what the, yeah, you know, I mean, that was part of being a production company. company. You yeah. had vocals, vocals is, is what, what made how, how you sound that advantage, advantage um, was, was part, part of the re- reason why people wanted, wanted to work with you. With and, you know, you know that, that advantage... advantage I, had I had several... several Advantages, advantages that, that on my, my team teams exclusively, and Coop was one of them early on in that run. run. It was a very, it was a superior vocal production that led to the, the dominance of some of those records. records. Yeah, legend. Um, the dream, like unmatched. Like, like I, think I think he's like, like I, think I think he's a freak of nature. Of nature. Like, like um, to, to be, be able to write. Fancy to come, come up with concepts, concepts like Holy Grail, Grail to, to write girls, girls who run the world, partition, partition love, love on top, baby. baby. The, the titles, titles like, like, I, like, like his, his titles, his thought process, his, his ability to look, look at, at pop, pop culture and and, and, um, and, and wrap, wrap it up in a song, I think, is unmatched, especially, especially being able, able to do it. it. From, from hip hop all the way to pop. pop. Mark Stewart. Man, Man that's, that's uh, uh Mark, Mark is uh Mark, Mark is a genius, genius too. too. I mean, you, you know, know, at, at the, the end of the day, day managers, managers are about creating opportunities and most importantly, um setting, setting you up, setting your life up, up setting, setting your money up, up creating wealth, wealth. and um one, One thing, thing I can say, say about, about our crew, crew everybody, everybody that ever worked with us, is paid. paid. <laughs> it's, it's very well paid. paid. You, know, you know, and we don't have any broke stories over here. here. Like, like, you know, you know we've we made, made, we made we made a lot of records, records but we, we were we we, we, we got, got paid, paid 
a lot. lot. And, and, uh, and I, I really, really thank him for putting, putting us in that position to uh, making, making sure, sure that we owned our publishing, publishing you know, you know making, making sure that, that you know, Dream has never had a publishing deal. deal. You, you know, know, that was a, it was a really, really big thing, thing you know, too, too. When, when you start, start talking about the songs that he has and, and, um, and then the things, things that he's created and creating the, you know, had a lot to do with the Kukurel career, the that position didn't exist as a third party with a separate check and a separate point. And, and that, that business, business was carved out and managed um, and, and created by Mark and Judy um, early on in that run, run to make sure that our camp, uh, that our camp was getting paid, paid and, and that people felt validated and, and, and that, um, you, know, you know, we fought hard, you know, when we walked in the door with Rihanna, Rihanna did not want to work with Coop, you know, she had a vocal producer and, you know, and since then, since that time when she had that session, she, she hasn't, hasn't made a song, song without him. him. So, you know, you know those, those relationships, relationships those, that, that kind of uh, going, going to Jay Brown and having, having those real conversations and digging in and fighting and saying, look, look if, if, if you, you don't want to use Coop, coop then we ain't doing, doing the song. Like, like those, those are the types, types of things that, you know, you, know, you, can't, you can't you can't put your finger on. So shout out to Mark for like, you know, Mark and Judy have managed me since I was 15 years old. Judy and I went to high school together. Um, they're, they're married, married. Um, um, and it's, it's just been, been it's, it's been, been pretty, pretty amazing, amazing the whole time. Well, then let, let's keep going with the fam. Let's do Laney Stewart. Laney, Laney Stewart, Stewart, he's the one. The, the, he's, he's how, how it all started, started for me. For me. Um, without, without him, him there, there would not even be the vision of being in the record business. Traditionally, in our family was in music, but like I said, I spoke a lot about church and jingles and things like that. But he was the pioneer. That wanted, that wanted to make records, records. He, he was, was the person, person that I saw, so he was the, um, he's, he's the mentor, he's, he's the kind of the, the captain of the, the Stewart family clan, and, and just, just the whole, even the mentorship that goes on, um, what it, what it means to be associated with myself or Red Zone or RZ3 or any iteration of, uh, company that we're doing, there's always not only the music, but there's also the, the, the accountability, accountability, there's the professionalism, there's the, there's the experience, and there's knowing how to make like really good decisions of, of how to advance your career uh, for longevity. So that's that's, that's what we get from from, from Lainey. All right, the last one, Red Zone. Shit, man. Red, Red Zone, Zone is, um, that's, that's it. it. I, mean, I mean, that was the, that's, that's the mantra. mantra. You, know, you know, it's always, like I said, it's always... Like it's always no matter no what, what, we, we, we can change, change our name, we sell, sell, sell companies, companies, things, things like, like that, that, but it's, it's the mantra of doing things, things that give you an opportunity um, is very, very important. important. And uh, uh, we, we, that, that red, red zone, zone as a buzzword for us is like, we know, we know when we're not in it. You know, that's, that's the other part. part. <laughs> you got to know, know it's like, I'm, I'm on the 40. I got to get, get to the 20, 20 so I have a shot. shot. You, know you know what I mean? It's a real literal, literal football, football term. term. So, so it's, it's, it's a quest to, to stay in it, but you're, you're not always in it. But, but um, if you if you identify with it, it then you won't give yourself excuses for coming up short. short. And, and that's, that's a big part of being successful in this business is that, you know, you got to... You gotta, you gotta put, put pressure, pressure on yourself to know that, that hey, you know what? what? Nobody's, Nobody's not trying. To, no, no one is trying to keep me out of this business. business. I'm, I'm just not writing big enough hits to kick in the fucking door. door. Like, like, and, and that's, that's the game. game. And, and everybody who we know who has a name and that has a whether it's Ricky Reed, whether it's Max Martin, whether it's Doctor Luke, whoever the fuck it is, they kicked in the fucking door. And there's no there's no way around that. When you listen to Polo to Don's music when he came out, or Jermaine Dupree, or these, these people that, like, like from, from my era and my generation that we're talking about, you listen, listen to the first impact of what you heard, heard and, and it was nothing like that. that. And that, that moment, moment for me was different, different because it was Umbrella, and I was, like, 10 years into my career. So I was, so I was a little bit of a late bloomer, but when I go back and listen to Dallas Austin working on Motown Philly, and then Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and, and the, the energy of those records, records he's, he's kicking in the door. door. And, and the same, same with organized noise coming in with outcasts and, and Goody Mob and Cell, cell Therapy and all those records and all that. that. They're, they're kicking the fucking door down. down. And you, you listen to I Kiss the Girl. girl. It's, it's like they're, they're kicking, kicking the door down. down. So 
yeah, yeah is, is it hard to get in? Do people sometimes, you know, you know like, like, you know, you, know, you hear all the time, time people are like, oh, the, the industry, industry this, the industry, that. that. No, it's, it's like, like you got to kick the door down to get in. Once you're in, it's cool. You'll understand the level that you have to play at, but it's hard to identify with something that you've never experienced. Yeah, something you said early on, you know, it's like when you're you, once you get used to being part of records that have a certain quality, and you start seeing songs react in, in accordance to like the the quality of the songs. You know, if your career, if you're if you're, you know, you you just start setting that bar of like, I can't, I don't go in there try to write songs. You know, I I have plenty. There's so many songs out there. It's like it, there's we say this a lot, but there it's so easy to write songs, really hard to write hits really hard to write hits but that means that you have to be focused and you have to like the, there's a certain purpose in that session to not like you're not you're yes you can just have fun when you're doing like a whole week and you're just writing and stuff but like show up aim yeah. for yeah. big you know and, and, and you, you know, know one, one of the things, things one, one of the biggest, biggest adjustments, adjustments in this, this industry, industry that, that i had to make is that, that that, that there, there are, are people, people this, this is a different, different time. time. Everyone, Everyone that's coming to, to, the, to the studio is not there for the same reason. reason. When, when I was coming up, everybody wanted not only a hit, but they wanted a Grammy. It was, it was how, how, how you recorded it. It, it, was, it, was, it was the, the presentation, presentation of it. Like You, you did things not, not only for the day, day you did things for history. I have re-recorded records because hit records are aligned on a record because I heard, I heard somebody's, somebody's mouth bump, bump the pop filter. filter. And, it's and it's like, ultimately, when if this, this record is what I think it is, I don't want somebody to come up and study my work and then go, damn, look, look at that. that. You, know you know what I mean? mean? It, and it's, it's like, like, it's one of those things that, that when you, you care, care a lot about this, this you have to ultimately dedicate yourself to that craft and to that level of craziness, I think, in order to be considered one of the greats. And that's, that's what, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying, trying to get in, in the conversation of some of the greats. And, you know, you know it's, 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 it's rare, rare up there. there. So, so you got to you have, you have to be elite, elite and there's, there's no way around it. it. Yeah, man. Well, uh, thank you for doing this. I, I think that there's no doubt that you're one of the greats. I don't think there's anybody who knows your name who doesn't think that you're one of the greats. And what's cool about it is like, dude, you're not just one of the greats because of your production or your songwriting or, you know, the, you know, being an executive, all those things you're great at, but it's because you treat the people around you with respect. It's the fact that people behind your back really love you, you know, and the fact that when you're, your your crew of people all did get paid and do get paid and that there's, there's not this story of like, oh yeah, but you can't write with them because the big guys eat the, you know, the big fish eat the little fish. Like that's not what's yeah. happening. You guys are fighting for each other. And it's man, it this it's it's always cool to be around you because you're you're a very smart guy and you're very accomplished because you're fucking motivated and it's <laughs> Thank exciting, you, man. I mean, like we're we're all in this trying to just you know we're we're all hustling together. We're all trying to do our own thing, but uh, it's fun to it's it's always been fun to watch your work and it's fun to be in the same business as you. Thank, Thank you, man, man. And, and you, you as well, well man. I, I'm, I'm I'm so glad, glad we got, got to reconnect. reconnect. This, this is so cool, cool that you're doing this, this and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to reconnecting, especially, especially musically and, and, and all that good stuff. Because it's, it's been a minute, but I'm I'm, I'm back on that shit, shit and it's it's, it's really exciting time. time and I would love to um, get 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 you even down to Atlanta for a week or so so that you can see what's going on down here once this is all over. There you go. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And the Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silverstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.